our mindset's really like we know what we want to achieve in life and we know what we've got to do each day when we wake up in the morning so each day it's it's a new challenge we always say all the time not hungry starving if you're hungry you can sort of like you can be distracted a little bit because you're, you're only hungry but if you're starving the only thing you're focused on is the starvation the main thing i think if you put work into any kind of business any kind of career you will be successful at the end of it it might not happen straight away but you might walk into a room one day and your whole life just changes like that a young dynamic duo the kettle kids these are two brothers from south london that had a vision they started in hatton gardens now their headquarters is in mayfair they sell watches from the best brands in the world to luxury customized jewelry this interview is inspirational motivational and educational be happy never content and subscribe right welcome back to the podcast steve Sally study i'm here at woodbury house art gallery over in mayfair and i've got some great guys in front of me entrepreneurs go-getters trailblazers there's so many different <laughs> titles for you guys so why don't you introduce yourself um, rather than me do it for you yeah, so my name's Harvey and I am a co-founder of the Kettle Kids. Yeah, and I'm Jacob, Harvey's brother, and we are, yeah, we, we own the Kettle Kids. So, a um, couple of weeks ago, we had an event in our, in our gallery in Mayfair. We were very priv privileged to bring over a LA pioneer, a guy called Defa. The reason why I call him a pioneer is because he started typography with a few other members uh, s some time ago. We were the first gallery to sign him and first gallery to bring him over to the to the UK. I know your background is watches and jewellery, but there is a crossover between watches, cars, art, luxury assets, etc. What was your um, take of the night? What was your take of the gallery? What was the take, your take on the artwork? Yeah, it was our first time obviously coming to Woodbury House and as soon as we walked in, the energy was great. It was a good vibe. We met Defa. He was a cool guy as well. I'm curious, do you know like... The clientele, I know, I know it's a bit of a party environment, so it's sometimes hard to really talk about business and stuff, but the clientele that you saw in our in our room uh, in comparison to the clientele that you guys have around the corner of Maddox Street, same, very similar? or I'd say very similar, uh, quite a mixed bunch. Uh, I think that comes with all different types of people have money now. So yeah. all different types of people um, get attracted to what you're selling or what you're showcasing. So I think it's quite a similar bunch of people, similar crowd, to be honest with you. Like, that's why we was there. Yeah. Um, and I hate to sound like I'm trying to plug something here, but you guys came in now and instantaneously you saw a piece on the wall and you thought, I'm going to have that. Yeah, we, we like to take risks. So um, we don't really know much about art, but obviously after speaking to Defa, speaking to yourself, your partner, we just thought, you know what, we'll take a shot at this. It, it, it seems like a good deal. And yeah, why not have a go? Yeah, it's really, really cool, cool artwork. Yeah. And uh, in, in, in years to come, because he's so important, I mean, the proof is in the I think the in. main thing is because he had a story and like he told a bit of his story and obviously we had a bit of a background on him. It was, it was in, we was intrigued with what he'd done. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, look, at, look at his pedigree. I mean, he's, he's done collabs with LA Lakers, uh, Apple, Facebook, Whole Foods. I mean, the list is endless. And these organisations wouldn't team up with just any old person. They only go with the right skilled, you know, the, the people that are celebrated worldwide mm. and and Defra is that. So anyway, let's talk more about you guys. Um, I love, so I think I told you before when I was messaging one of you over uh, Instagram, Instagram because I don't know which one of you actually takes control <laughs> yeah. of Instagram. But both anyway, of us, both of us, yeah. my voice noted and um, what I typically say to people is, being 37, when I was younger, there was no such thing as podcasts or even social media. And I know social media and podcasting can be a bit of a blessing and a curse sometimes. It can be a distraction, which is a curse, but the blessing is you can hear stories by successful entrepreneurs, athletes, go-getters, celebrities, and it can give you a bit of inspiration. You were just telling me earlier about the Alfie Best one that he gave an analogy in the podcast and it, and it triggered something. Yeah. So anyway, long, long, long story short, I wanted to get you guys on because I feel that there could be a young man or young female listening to this episode and thinking, Do you know what, what these guys have done, that's really inspired me to take my own leap of faith and go in a similar sort of direction. So if we start from the beginning of your entrepreneurial yep. journey, am I right in saying that you borrowed £1,000 for your nan to start <laughs> your brand? 
Yeah. yeah, it doesn't sound real, does it? Yeah, but yeah. That's how it started. Yeah. There's a lot of people that have done similar sort of things. Yeah. I don't know the, the full story ins and outs of the Candy Brothers, but I've heard that they had a similar story. Candy Brothers are, yeah. you know, billionaire ty- property tycoons yeah. who, who I think borrowed like 5,000 from their grandparents and, and now look at them. Um, but with that in mind, it can be a bit of a risk borrowing from your family members, right? Yeah, definitely. But do you know what is your... For us, if we go way back to when we did borrow that money, it's like when you don't want to ask your mum and dad for something as a, as a child, you lean on the soft touch, which is your grandparents. You know, like your grandparents give you sweets when you're not supposed to have it, blah, 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 all the rest of it. So for us, it's like we was unemployed, um, not really much going on, knocking about. We always, we was always wheeling, dealing, always like hustling as kids. Like, you know, like the typical selling all the all sweets in the school and all the rest of it. We was always doing that. And then we, we sort of never had nothing to do, no career. Um, we had a few good grades from school and stuff. Like, I'm not going to say we was down and out, but started like having a real passion for watches. Uh, started like, had my own watch. But I didn't want to sell my own watch to start a business because I thought like it was a bit sentimental to me. So I thought if I borrow a thousand pounds off my nan, then we can like get the ball rolling with cheaper watches and see how it goes. So yeah, that's pretty much what we did. We borrowed a thousand pounds off my nan and off, off our nan yeah. and then, yeah, just kept it rolling. So I was going to actually ask you about that. I mean, the watch you've got on right there, the watch you've got on right here, you know, watches that we all own, a thousand pounds probably wouldn't even buy you one little link in yeah. the bracelet yeah. in today's world. Yeah. So how did you invest that money into what how with with who so it was in 2017 so harvey took the leap of faith and said i'm going to borrow a thousand pounds off our nan and we're going to get into the watches at this time i didn't have a job i just left my job i was actually working as a plumber before and not a plumber, i was sorry. A, i was a plumber yeah yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so as i was before i was working as a tyler and okay. um, i was working at tower bridge and it kind of just wasn't for me harvey said to me let's get into the watches and i was like watches like mate nobody buys watches what are you talking about he was from south london we just thought like <laughs> it wasn't a thing do you know what i mean he was like listen we'll get into the watches and we'll see how it goes so i left my job he had a job before and with a thousand pound from my nan we bought three cartier 21 sports at the time that's all you could really afford like you said now it wouldn't even get you one link on the watch the way the watch market's gone but yeah and then we never really looked back from there so how much are one of those Cartiers today? So today you'll be able to get one for about around £1,850 for one. In 2017, we bought three of them, I think, for £900. There was £300 a piece. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. We, and, we, and we bought them off eBay as well. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Bit risky? Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, yeah, it is a bit risky to be fair. But it's like we knew this was what we wanted to do like from the get-go because we had passion for watches, like I said. Um, we knew what, is what we wanted to do and... Just, just, yeah, just put the blinkers on. Yeah. Just. So, okay. Um, so you had a passion for watches. Was that something that naturally came or did that passion develop over time? It did. De- I think it naturally came, to be honest with you, because my dad always had a nice watch on. Um, and like other family members always had a nice watch. And where, where you're from London, you sort of see having a nice watch as a bit of success uh, straight away. Like if someone's got a nice watch on, nice pair of trainers, even go as far as a car, then you sort of see that person is doing well, especially where we're from. So it's a bit of a, uh, I think it's a bit of a symbol. Like, Well, I, I, I see it as a badge of honour. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I see it as a, a medal yeah. that, you know, you couldn't walk around the street with a medal on, but what you can do is put a nice watch on a nice bit of jewellery or, or like you said, nice car, etc. Yeah. And I also think as well, look, even the most successful people in the world have bad days. And I think when you sit back in your chair, you look down, got a nice watch on, it reminds you that actually you're a winner. And that's why I think sometimes it's a really, really good investment. Forget whether it goes up or down or not. How does it make you feel? Yeah. How are you greeted in a room when you've got it on? Yeah. Obviously, you can't be... It portrays you in a different yeah. light as well. Yeah. 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 I think it's a, it's a good icebreaker. I think you go into a room and there's rapport straight away. Um I know it can be a little bit shallow yeah. just to think it's all about, uh, but, but it, does, it does open up doors when, you're, when you've got a passion like art, like watches, like cars, and it's something to talk about with other successful it's people. Yeah, it's a star. conversation star, yeah. that is it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, okay, would you say watches overall are a good investment? Yes. Why? The reason I'd say why, if you look at it on a 
strategic way from five to ten years as an investment, then you the market obviously now is currently at probably the lowest it's been in five years, for example. But then if you look at it over a 10 year scale or 15 year scale, even a 20 year scale, the watches just keep going up. I know obviously sometimes it goes down, sometimes it goes back up. But in the long run, if you look at a watch from like 1990s and the value of it now is valued more than most watches, which are like brand spanking new. So the proof's in the pudding. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So when you're, because I feel like the language with what you guys do, what we do are, will be quite similar. And then there's all this probably separate conversations that you might have with strict investors. So most of the time, 95% of the time, we're having conversations with collectors that, yeah, they do care about not losing money. They do care about making money, but really and truly, they want to decorate their home office. Yeah. They like the story. They like the narrative. And that's more important. And then the the, the, the kind of secondary uh, motivation is, well, hopefully in five or 10 years, it's going to go up in value. Yeah. But do you actually have investors that approach you and say, right, I've got a hundred grand. What would you advise me to put my money into, you know what? and what do you think the projection of the watch is going to be? I knew you were going to ask a question like this, but you know those sort of people. I don't really tend to love them, people. To be honest with you, because we like to sell watches to people who are enthusiasts who like what they're buying. My, our, my sorry, my personal advice always to someone is buy what you like, like, like we just said, and if it goes up, it's a bonus. But the main first stage is buy what you like. Don't just buy things hoping it's going to make you rich because to be honest with you, most of the time it's not. And if you want something to make you rich, then go and work hard, go and build a business, go and build a brand, go and invest your money in stocks and shares if that's what you believe. But watches and same with art maybe, buy what you like and if it goes up, it's a bonus. Like we didn't know nothing about the death of art really the other week, to be honest with you. We walked in blind. We see it, we liked him, we like you guys, we like the art and we bought it. And if it goes up, it's a bonus. Both night it looks pretty on the wall. I think that's where the market's kind of changed in the last three to four years is because most people now who are buying watches putting your uh, thing a little bit closer yeah, yeah, yeah. so most That's people it. now who I are think you're sweet. most people now who are buying watches are actually only buying watches for investment purposes they're not actually buying them because they like them and so now when the market does take a little bit of a hit the invest people the people who are invested in them and not buying them because they like them and want to enjoy them they're selling so then that's making the market go down even more Do you get what i mean because there's more of the watches on the market so that's mm. where i think the market yeah it's it, it's, it's, there's two different clientele, isn't there? Like you said, there's a person who wants to invest in watches and there's a person who wants to buy a watch because they like it. We like selling, obviously, to both, but we prefer to sell to somebody who's actually like obsessed with this watch and like wants to know everything about it and wears it and enjoys it. Um, I was going to say, actually, in the times of COVID lockdown, etc., 2020 and 21 to 2022, sort of, a little bit, it seemed like the watch market, luxury assets actually mm -hmm. just went through the roof. I mean, certain cars, you could you could get a Porsche Turbo, for example, or Ferrari 458 um, retail. And if, if you were lucky enough to get it retail, mm -hmm. put it on secondary market and you could pretty much double your money. I mean, it was almost like making money in this, in this, in this sector was, Very you easy. could do it blind. Yeah. And unfortunately there was the birth of so-called experts off the back end of that because like bitcoin like anything that goes up when the market is rallying you could call yourself an expert because yeah. you could say next week it's going to go up and guess what it does yeah, yeah, yeah. because the market is rallying but the moment it tanks the so-called experts all dis disappear how have you seen your industry change since that moment in time and what have you seen to the prices i think in that in the COVID period, like we said, prices through the roof. Everyone couldn't get enough. Everyone wanted to spend their money. Everyone's sitting at home, um, getting whatever sort of payments they was getting or wages still. They had nothing to spend on, no holidays, no restaurants, no clubs. I don't know, whatever they usually do with their money. Then, so now people have all got money in their accounts, burning a hole in their pocket. Watch prices are going up and up every day. Can't find the watches. You can't travel around the world to get watches. You can't be imported, exported, anything like that. So each country is his own sort of market now so in the states certain models through the roof over here certain models through. we couldn't get enough we couldn't get enough now the day date green which i've actually got on today couldn't get them quick enough as soon as we had it gone and then it come up to a point where it's like people are leaving deposits paying for things before you've even got them just saying as soon as it arrives put my name to it and it it just becomes a bit crazy to be honest with you. And it like, like we was just saying, it becomes like everyone's jumped on the bandwagon and then everyone's a watch dealer. 
No one wants to do their other job anymore because this is seen as to be easy money. And since then, I believe all the so-called watch dealers, now the market's come down a little bit, have all gone on to other careers or other jobs or other things to pass their time. And left standing is the strong. The, the, the people like ourselves who love watches, love jewellery, love dealing with people, love dealing with, with watch enthusiasts. And I think that's sort of like where the passion is. And I think that's what will like last. So from, from your perspective then, stripping all that away from like a bit of a business advice then, passion, belief, determination, dedication, yeah. hard work. Uh, is that what you're saying that your message is? When, when people talk about Kettle Kids, is that the kind of underlining factors? 100%, yeah. We believed since we first started Kettle Kids in 2017 that we was going to make it into a massive brand. And we believed, we, we still say to each other now, like walking here today, we said, we, we knew you was going to ask this question. I said to him, <laughs> like, like, what we, like, we know what we're going to say to this, you know what I mean? What we are is hardworking young people who have got a lot of time on our hands compared to the older generation, the old school jewelers, we're the new generation. And we've set an example to all the other young guys who want to get into the watch world. They always message us, they ask us for advice and we give it to them because I'm only 25, Harvey's 28, 27, 27 28 soon. And um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And we, took, we, took, we took the risk, you know what I mean? And it is possible to end, for anybody to do. You just got to work hard. That's the main thing. I think if you put work into any kind of business, any kind of career, you will be successful at the end of it. It might not happen straight away, but you might walk into a room one day and your whole life just changes like that. I yeah, do, I do yeah. feel like we set the bar for the younger, gen the younger than us generation of watch dealers. We can get onto that in a bit, but I do, f I do feel like that. Do you know what you were saying earlier as well? The hard work. I, I agree with all that, but my take on it as well is your. This can sound like a really wanky word, but authentic. And yeah. what I mean by that is. You've embraced this, 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 this name, Kettle Kids, yeah? Yeah. And I think a lot of certainly older school-minded people would shy away from a term like kids yeah. because they think, oh, you could. But what I like about it is you're basically saying with that, I started young. We were kind of kids getting into this, mm -hmm. but we are young in heart and we're bringing a new energy to this whole corporate watch space. Yeah. And I think a lot of people embrace embracing yeah. that and they like it. Yeah. That's they really I mean. like when it. Was, when we was based, we had an office in Aldgate and then we went over to Cavendish Square. Which no, we've done before. Yeah, Canary Wolf. Canary Wolf. So we went from Canary Wolf to Aldgate and then Aldgate to Cavendish Square. And then when we was in Cavendish Square, we was like, Harvey was just walking down Maddox Street one day and see this shop and it was like to rent. And he said, he come back that day and he was like to me, there's a shop down Maddox Street opposite Maddox Gallery. And he said, it's a great street. It's very famous, very popular. He said, why don't we go for it? And the first thing we thought in our head was like, crap, we're called Kettle Kids. Kettle Kids. Like, how is Kettle Kids yeah. going to sound in Mayfair? And at the, at the time, our branding was kind of like a, not a graffiti type, but it was a bit different to what it is now, not slick. And um, we was like, what are we going to do? And we worried, we we literally worried about it. And we said, mate, like we've built this up from 2017 to now. There's no way we're changing our name from Kettle but Kids. But there was that element of doubt. Yeah. It? Yeah. There was that element of doubt, but we knew how hard we've worked to build that name up and down the country around Europe and around the world. People know us as the young guys. Like, mate, we used to get slaughtered for being called the Kettle Kids. The story is a little bit like Tommy Mallet. Okay. So, do you know, obviously Tommy Mallet isn't, his name isn't Tommy Mallet, but the reason why he called it Mallets is because his cousin used to take the mick out of him for having a mallet head. He's go, oh, a mallet head. So what he did is he took something and turn almost a negative into a real positive force yeah. and just embraced it and then turned it into this massive corporate shoe yeah. juggernaut and yeah, he's, he's done really, really well. When we watch your podcast of him, we, we look at him innit, and we say, yeah, and And it's the same thing with you guys. You're authentic, you're true to, you know, you don't try and change who you are. And I think, I think that's really, really good. I think it's quite easy to build up a brand and think, oh, is Mayfair going to accept us for who we are? Should I pivot into something else? And I think you might have lost a bit of your audience Definitely. if you would have done that. Uh, do you know what? Every time I think of that, and we're just going to call it, we're based on 16 Maddox Street. And I thought, should we go super slick? Should we just call it like 16 Maddox Street? Do you know, like something that really, sounds really cool. But I was like, it's not who we are. Like, it's not what got us here. It's not, it's not like, let's show the brand, the respect, everything that is shown us. Let's, let's give it back a little bit. Let's like stay true to ourselves. Let's stay true to our customers, our clients, our fans, or wherever you want to, the people we know, everyone who's been a part of it, let's stay true to it and 
and, and, and stand, by, stand by what it meant all them years ago. Before I ask you why you call Kettle yeah. Kids, I'm going to give you a, a test. You probably know it. <laughs> Cockney rib, uh, rhyme, rhyming or slang. Kettle. Why is kettle linked to watches? I don't answer. You know the answer. I don't know the answer. <laughs> kettle and hob is a fob and that's a pocket watch. That's it. Yeah. All right. I'll, I was wondering whether or not you're going to know that. The truth of the matter is we didn't actually know that until we went to a friend of ours' wedding. Well, he was in the toilet. And told me in the yeah. toilet. Yeah. yeah. He was in the toilet and an old boy come up to us and he was having a toilet. He was having a toilet. He just looked at me and Arby and he was like, kettle kids, isn't it? And we was like, yes, mate. Oh, nice to meet you. He was like, you know what kettle means? We was like, yeah, it just means like if you're from London, like kettle's a watch, mate. He was like, no. Like, and then he got into the detail. Do you know what but I mean? That's how we learn it. Because the, the hard thing about it as well, if you're trying to, if you're trying to tell this to an alien or yeah. try and tell it to someone who's foreign who has no understanding about Cockney slang yeah. or rhyme, it's one of the only terms that doesn't actually rhyme together. So, you know, if you look at everything like apple and pear, yeah, stairs yeah, and all yeah. that kind of stuff, it's one of the only ones that do, doesn't rhyme. Yeah. So it's a bit of a weird psychology to it's work like, out yeah. why that is called, yeah, yeah. Uh, a watch is called kettle, but yeah. yeah. Um, so kettle, so kettle kids, why are you called kettle kids? I'll explain why we're called kettle kids. We're called the kettle kids because like Jacob said, from London, everyone knows that a kettle is a watch. So before we was called kettle kids, we was wheeling and dealing from the thousand pounds, selling watches up and down the country, <laughs> eBay, collecting in car parks, Costa coffees, all that sort of stuff. All the crazy stuff where you look back and you think like, anyway, so we used to knock about over Hatton Garden a lot, buying a watch, selling a watch, buying a watch, selling a watch. And one day I got a phone call from a friend of mine, fellow watch dealer, and he was like, have you been over Hatton Garden today? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, all it is is this old boy, um, he's, a, he's about 60 odd. I said, yeah. He said, he owns a jewellers over there. Do you know it? I said, no, I don't know it. He said, he's, I can't remember his name. He went, yeah, he said he's ranting and he's banging on his table and he's effing and blinding. I said, about what? Like, he's like, they, apparently there's these two kids running around uh, selling, selling uh, watches. They're only kids. This ain't a kid's game and all the rest of it. So from then, me and him was laughing in the car on the loudspeaker. I said to him, do you know what? Fuck it. We'll just call it the kettle kids. I was like, if they want to mug us off and take the piss, we'll take the piss out of ourselves and show them who's a kid. We'll show them who sells watches here, mate. <laughs> and then that was six years ago, and here we are, yeah. So, okay, you, you were selling watches from, from Hatton Gardens or, do, or yeah. doing, you know, doing your dealing, etc. cetera. Um, just for the audience, because some people will not understand the relevance of Hatton Gardens, they, they probably think now about the, the heist because that was all glorified <laughs> yeah. and all, obviously the documentaries yeah. and stuff. But before that, yeah, yeah. many, many... Jewelers, watch dealers, etc. Diamond dealers will go to Hatton Gardens. Why is Hatton Gardens such an important place for you guys? Um, it's an important place to us because that is really where we started. Um, obviously, we was wheeling, dealing. We social media wasn't massive then. There was probably three, four other dealers who was on social media smashing it at a time. And the only way to get known and get your name out there was to put the work in. So putting the work into me and Harvey was getting up in the morning. The first job of the day, we're getting Hatton Garden. We'll go in every single shop and it isn't a joke. We'll start on Greville Street. We'll get to the yeah. top and we'll go, right. And then um, we'll go in every single shop. We'll find out what watches they've got, how much they're priced at. And mate, sometimes we'll start at the beginning of Greville Street. We'll go in one shop and we'll get to the top of Greville Street. And that person's asked us for that watch they got down there. Right down the end. And all we'd do, we go get it from there, go there and sell it to him. And it maybe earn £200 or £250. We we'll were just going door to door. Door to door. But I think because it's the hub, it's the hub yeah. of England. It's like, if you go to New York, it's 47th Street. If you go to Los Angeles, it's downtown LA, Diamond District. I've been to the Diamond Districts all over the world. Hat Garden is, as such, London's Diamond District or gold watches, jewellery, whatever you want to call it. It's the district of jewellery. But I just think it's, you sort of grab that, you grab done your like, legwork in Hat Garden to evolve, I believe. Uh, you can't just, in my opinion, you can't just turn up in the UK without doing, going through the Hatton Garden shift. Some people, some people have great success over there and they're still there. Like amazing businesses, amazing brands, all in Hatton Garden. But I think you have to go through that Hatton Garden sort of stage and sort of apprenticeship to then branch out and do what you're looking yeah, to do. It's a bit like uh, the amateur boxing league. Mm. Get your pedigree there and yeah. then switch over to the pro, pro league. league. 
Yeah. You know, if you just try and go into the pro league, there are some examples where people have done it, but yeah. very, very few and far. Very yeah, yeah, very few and far between. The legwork I've had in garden, like we was literally for a few years, for a good few years, we was over there. We was just not knocking about. Like, mate, we were selling watches out of Costa. We were selling watches out the back of our cars. You know, what I mean, but that's what you, you're building your name. Yeah, you're building reputation. So, anyone who goes to Hatton Garden or asked about us or the rest of it, like I said, that that was one old guy who was a bit bitter, probably that times have changed and wanted to call us kids. But the truth is, they was all talking about us. Like, we was getting like we was just getting spoke about everywhere because it had a ring to it. These kids, these kids, these kids. And like I said, at the time. There was no one younger than us doing it. I was 21. Jacob was 18. Yeah. Like 18 and 21 year olds was not selling watches. For one, they weren't selling watches. For two, they wasn't trusted to sell watches because they're high valuables. And for three, they didn't, 18 to 21 year olds, like most of our friends then were out raving. They didn't even know how to do a deal. So you, so you're walking down the Hatton Gardens and yeah. you're going from door to door and you find out what watches they've got and who wants but to buy the, watches. In the meantime, we're taking photographs. So we're not just writing it down. We're taking good photographs, which went straight onto our social media of stuff we didn't own. We didn't have the money to own all that stock. But the nice, genuine people down there were letting us take photos, letting us have the details of the watches or the jewelry or whatever. So straight away on the photo album, bang, get three, four down, doors down the line. You'd say to someone, for instance, you after anything? Like you're looking for anything? You've got any customer requests? Or blah. And then that guy might say, not really, but I'm, I am after this. And you think, light bulb. It was like we was a middleman because there's a lot That's of jewellers that don't get on with other jewellers. And so like he wouldn't go there and look for something and he wouldn't go there and look for something. But we was in the middle. So what we done, we was just, we was the new kids on the block. We was the nice kids. We've always been polite. We've always been respectful. So what we done, we built up a, a lot of trust and we always had a good name, me and Harvey, from when we started to now. And that's the main thing. I think you've got to keep your name really clean because it takes years to build it and a minute to lose it. Do you know what I mean? Door to door... I know a lot of good salespeople that have built up their resilience and their skill set, mindset from door to door, yep. selling all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yours is a slightly different version of that, but it is essentially the same sort of thing. My question, Jacob Harvey, who is a better salesperson? Personally, I think it's me. What do you reckon? <laughs> I think Jacob's more of a people person yeah. than me, but I think we both... Obviously, well, we're brothers as well. Some people don't, like, they can't understand how brothers can work together. I think we're chalk and cheese, yeah. but I do agree. Day to day, Jacob's a better salesman than me, but I think on the slower, bigger deals, I'm a better salesman. You were doing door to door, but now you're in Maddox Street, and I don't know if you want to share this, but speculating your overheads over there is going to be tens of thousands of pounds a month, maybe even a hundred thousand pounds a month. Yep. You've got to sell a lot of watches. Yep. So does that ever creep into your mind thinking, bloody hell, I've got a massive commitment here. I'm in Mayfair. I'm in one of the most prestigious rows in London. Um, and I've got this brand and I've got all the staff and overheads. What is your mindset like when you think about that? I think our mindset's really like we know what we want to achieve in life and we know what we've got to do each day when we wake up in the morning. So each day it's, it's a new challenge and we just dig deep, really. We get in the, we get in the shop. And we get involved, you know what I mean? And like you said, yeah, we have got massive overheads and massive commitment now because we've got a lot of staff and we didn't have staff and it was just me and Harvey just by ourselves. So now we just literally get in and work as hard as we can each day and we know that that's good enough. We sort of tackle it like Everest, yeah. you know, like if you think you can do Everest in a day, you never, you can't do it. But we sort of do small steps and just sort of chip away at it every day. Like if you wake up every morning, maybe yourself as well, like, and think of all the things that are going against you and all the money that you've got to find and all and all the things in life that you can't really control you won't achieve it but if you just think of all the little small things you can do the small steps before you know it you start achieving big things and it's us we both totally agree with positive mindset with like no negative vibes no negative attitude no one around us negative just positive mindset and you can just achieve anything and make as much money as you can yeah our team of people who we got with us now we're all positive we all know what we want to achieve and we know where we want to go like, even for the brand ourselves, we know what we we know that level we want to get to and in such a short period it's been so quick and it's happening so fast and we're like try and slow it down a little but then it gets faster do you know what i mean so yeah to be honest with you i feel like you're always gonna like imagine apple or nike or reebok anyone imagine their overheads like 
yeah, with massive overheads, you're like maybe similar to yourself with the with the place that you've got here. But what a massive brand that you're that you, you've got. What a massive business you've got. What a massive network you've got. So does the overheads really matter? I don't think so. And it, it's testament to your belief again and your vision for the future. Yeah. You know, um, even though to an outsider they could be sceptical about things, in actual fact, it shows that you have one hundred percent belief where 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 you're about to where you're about to go. Mm-hmm. So on that note of goals, ambition, and where you want to get the Kettle Kids as 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 a brand and as a shop a retailer, yeah. where what does the next few chapters look like? No doubt about it, we will for sure have multiple stores around the world in the future. That's our goal. Well, it will happen, yeah. We know that. We speak about it every day. Every we, put day in, yeah. we put it out there. Do you know what I mean? We believe in manifestation, so we put it out there. And everything we have said before, we've achieved so far. So, yeah, we want to have multiple stores all around the Across world. Across the globe, yeah. yeah. We want to be a worldwide... I feel like we're... In the UK, we're recognised, we're known, we're trusted, and all the rest of it. But I feel like globally, is that's the, that's the goal for us. So you got a really good following on Instagram and pretty much across the, a few different uh, channels, but predominantly you're Instagram. you're you're you're, yeah, you're, yeah. you're 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 really hot on Instagram. Almost two hundred thousand followers on now. I think one hundred eighty thousand when I last checked. Um, what part does it play to build your brand and revenue and get new clients, customers, collectors? What part does Instagram play in your success? I think Instagram is definitely something that we're obsessed with. As a tool, so like I said, back in 2017, when we was like door to door in Hatton Garden, no one was like really on Instagram as such as a jeweler. There was a few, but they wasn't like taking, we was taking cool photos straight away off the, off like right off the mark. Cool photos, information on the, on the watch and sort of getting people's brains ticking. How does the watch look on their wrist? Is it the right color? How does it feel? Can they have a video of it? Can it? All that sort of stuff is sort of like, not reverse psychology, but it makes people want it because they can imagine wearing it. They can dream of wearing it. And so I think Instagram, like I go on Instagram, look at cars, I look at houses, I look at all different things, maybe similar to yourself, look at art. I look at all that stuff on Instagram or on social media. But I think when you're selling an item, you can really make someone want it if it's photographed well or it's presented in a nice way. And for us, that's why we stick to Instagram because it's, it's yeah, it's great. You build up your desire, right, for yeah. your, your your collectors. It's it's in their face because they're they're following you and they're and they're, they're tracking this. That's it. Exactly. To something you normally got to see it, and it's got to keep popping up. In and that's how Instagram works so well for us because it's such a massive social media platform. And the more you post, you seem to we well what we notice is the more we post and the more it's in somebody's face as such the more sales we get from it. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, so, you are, so you will get literally DMs from people saying, I like this watch. Can I come and view it? How much is it? No, some people strip that yeah. back. Some people just like send bank details. Yeah. Really? Send invoice. Like yeah. instant. And we're talking not from like a, we can vary from a £5,000 watch up to a £100,000 yeah, watch. Well, like, Someone would just say, I'll take that. What's your bank details? We give them the bank details, the payments Some made. clients have never collected the watches. Some have, We've never met. It's yeah. just literally bank details, payment, watch is yeah. gone. Sometimes it's not even like we have oh to God. speak to them. They, you send the watch somewhere yeah. and that's it. Yeah. But, but this is what brings me back to the fact is like, it must stick in people's brains, the photo or the video that we've done, for them to trust us so much. Obviously they trust the brand, they followed it, they've done their research, but they must trust the photograph we've took or the video. They trust it so much that it's going to look well on their wrist without trying on. The watch is just straight in the mail, gone. Track signed, insured, job done. Next day, they've got it. But what goes through people's brains to do that? And people say to us, oh, you guys are lucky, you're young. Uh, It's a bit of a fluke that you've got this successful business or brand or whatever, but hold on a minute. There's plenty of other people that have started at the same time or before, and they they haven't got the social media that we've got. They haven't got the following. They haven't got the brand. And I think a lot of that comes back to us being authentic people. To be honest with you, yeah, and I don't really like to say that we're authentic about yourself. Like, I don't like to call myself authentic, but there must be that sort of element there. Yeah, and when you're messaging people back, it's not a robot, and it's not some sort of corporate st- structure message. It's just you being genuine people. That's it. Yeah, I think yeah, that's we've important. never we never changed it from how we started it, like how we message people, how we talk to people. We treat everybody the same because 
We don't have no automatic yeah. replies, responses Nothing. like that. Literally, as soon as, that's what, when you said earlier, who am I speaking to? It literally be me, Jacob, or one of the boys in the shop. It's not no robot you're talking to. So straight away, you can trust that you're speaking to a real person who's got like genuine intentions. Yeah, it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Kettle kids, it's uh, deceiving because it's not just kettles. It's jewellery as well. And every time I think about your brand, I am thinking about the watches, but when I went onto a YouTube channel, for example, earlier, or looking through some of your posts, huge element is the customised jewellery. Yeah. So what ratio is watches and what ratio is customised jewellery if you were to say, I don't know, you turn over a million pound, how much of that is on watches, how much of that is on jewellery? I'd say 70-30. Yeah, 70-30. On, yeah, on a scale. Just over two thirds for watches and just under a third yeah. for jewellery. And you started purely on watches. When did you decide to start getting into jewellery? We got into jewellery when we had our office in Aldgate. So that was... I think when it started getting more celebrities, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it comes with time because you master something. And what we done, we mastered the watches. And then we thought we got to try and step out of our comfort zone a little bit yeah. and get into the jewellery. But it's the same industry. Watches and jewellery go so well together. And people who normally buy watches like jewellery... So it worked well for us. And I think it was in 2019 or 2020, yeah, in the Minery's office, um, we started to get into jewellery, yeah. I watched a really good video that I think you said it was posted about a year ago with Russ Millions. Yep. And um, I, I've heard his music, but I didn't really know too much about this guy until I started listening to him. Mm. And he seems like a really, really nice guy. And he really adores you guys because he kept on saying, you know, you're the best jewellers <laughs> in, 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 in the UK. Um how did you come across someone like Russ Millions? Um, we came across him through a client of ours who then recommended us through word of mouth, basically, saying, go and use these guys. They're very trustworthy, good prices, good service. And yeah, that's how we met him. And I from then we built think, a massive relationship. I think when he was buying jewelry before of other uh, companies, he wasn't getting the right treatment that he was looking for. He wasn't getting the right service, products. I don't think he had that connection with them. And to be honest with you, a lot of our celebrity clients now, including Russ, who's become they've become like a friend, like a like literally phone on all the time. Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we swap this? Can we swap that? I want after this, I'm after that. Like it just it never ends. It sort of becomes part of the Kettle Kids family, to be honest with you. All the um clients. And with him, it's just like find someone who's obsessed with watches and jewelry. You find someone who's on the main stage, like he had a number one um single worldwide a couple of years ago. So like he was all over the world with watches and jewelry they bought off us and we was like this is cool like this is this is this is what we want to do the the the, the interesting thing about the youtube video i watched with him and he was kind of narrating it along with you guys and going through his watch collection and jewelry collection a lot of people i meet it certainly in the art space are normally like kind of collectors who are from the business world they're a little bit more kind of private but the good thing about someone like a rapper or a music artist, they're kind of forward facing a lot more and they're, they're kind of open with yeah. the fact that how much money they spend on certain yeah. things. And it was nice to hear the amount of... I think they're a bit like that because they, they come from nothing. Yeah, and I also think it helps. I actually think that stance they take probably helps them in their career. 100%. Whereas if he was a banker and he was saying that sort of stuff, I think that would actually work against him work because... Against him, yeah. because it's the industry you know, we're in, isn't it's it? It's the industry. Yeah, that's, that's it. what it is. You know, he's in the rap industry. He needs to be out there. Do you know what I mean? And that that's what he is. He's, he's a cool He's eyeballs on him, right? But in order to, to, to sell his music. That's it. How, yeah. how much do you think he's actually spent with you guys? Um, realistically, I would say about, about 1.2 million pounds, something like that, roughly. Yeah, over a million pounds. Yeah, over a million pounds. And would you say he's your biggest client or do you have bigger clients? He's one of our biggest clients. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And can you list like any other celebrities that you, you deal with? We've got plenty of footballers, but like going back to it, footballers like to stay quite private in opposed to um, being out there. We've got a lot of also collectors, um, okay. watch enthusiasts. I wouldn't say investors, but I'd say watch enthusiasts. We've got like, we've got one guy, he's bought maybe 20 watches of us. Just one, yeah, one guy over the last few years. Um it's countless amount of yeah, celebrities, countless yeah. Countless amounts. But a lot of people don't like to, like you said, different industries, like the rappers, they like to be known. The footballers don't want to be known. They want to keep it on the low. The businessmen don't want to be known. So we just made two custom pieces over the last six months for one for uh, Drake, but that was commissioned by another celebrity. We went to Miami and dropped that off to him. To Drake? Yeah. yeah. 
Ed what was Murphy. he like to meet? Yeah, he's a cool guy. He's, yeah. got, he's got mad energy around yeah, him. Shining. Shining, like, yeah. yeah. Got a good light, yeah. That sort, of, that sort of stuff inspires us. Do you know, yeah. like when you meet someone like that who's on like the next level to what we're trying to do in another world, but you can, you've got respect for, the, for what he's done. You've got respect of how he carries on. So the so you made the jury via one of the connections, and then the first time you actually met Drake is when you dropped off the piece of customized jewelry to him. To my in Miami at his birthday yeah. party. Yeah, literally, it was a whirlwind. We was like, that's it, that's, it, it, that's, it, that's, that's good stuff, yeah. man. We we turned up in Miami. Well, we literally had like two three days notice. We yeah. got permission to make it by a Jamaican music artist called Popcorn. Um, who's now a very, very close friend of ours. And we That's who show I'm going yeah, to this evening, yeah. We can't let the missus down to yeah. <laughs> We count him, as fam- count him as part of our family. And um, he said, listen, we need to make this piece for Drake because his birthday coming up. I want you guys to make it for him and fly out to Miami at his birthday party. And that's what we did. We turned up in Miami. Yeah. We do, we, it was we crazy. Do commission, yeah. We do get commissioned some pieces like that. And from that, you just it just sort of evolves and you just create another network. Like, we done that in October, and then in January, um, Popcorn invited us to go to Jamaica. So I went to, I was in the States, and then I flew from the States over to Jamaica, and he looked after us over in Jamaica for a week, and that was like next level. Okay, um, the the jewelry aspect of, of stuff is it? Would you say it's mostly chains, or is it other things like glasses, bracelets? Etc. Um, mainly for the rappers and stuff like that, it's mainly chains and um, custom pendants. So a custom pendant is what sits on the chain. So it's, it's 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 basically made unique just for this one person. So each pendant you make is basically a one of one because you can't yeah. really make it. It's for that person, and you go through a whole design thing to get it to where it needs to be for them to be happy. And the process takes a long time. It takes probably. We'd like to say six to eight weeks, but it normally goes on for about 12 weeks because yeah. you need to get it perfect. All the changes. Yeah. But yeah, we do sell bespoke made glasses, bracelets, chains, pendants, but we ma- mainly we're selling at the moment, I would say chains and bracelets. Chains and bracelets, yeah. yeah. You, so you, you mentioned about this the couple of different demographics, your audience and your, your collectors, your buyers, right? And... A lot of the, the a couple of things you said there resonate with me because I've had Kim Richardson, for example, who's in the watch game, right? Yeah, He's yeah. been on my podcast a couple of times, a good friend of mine, etc. I know a lot of footballers go to him because being ex Man United, trustworthy individual, yeah. knows his stuff, etc. And his clients, you know, he, he just keeps very, very private. And so we should, you know, yeah. that's, that's the right way to be. But there is obviously an element of fear that if someone gets known for having a watch collection, they can become a target. I mean, the amount of conversations I've had in this podcast with people that have either been robbed or know people that have been robbed is is is, is a lot. I've had it had it myself. It's it's not a nice thing. Um, it's a t- taboo subject. Yeah. But is there is there ever that element of fear about because you're so well known in that industry of watches and jewelry that you could become a target? Yeah, I think you can become a target in any walk of life, though. And if, if even if you're not selling watches, you're a target. If you're just wearing one, you're a target. If you've got, if you're a female and you've got a nice handbag, or you're a teenager and you've got a, a new iPhone in your hand, it can be taken from you. I feel like anything with um, of value can be taken from you if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think you have to be streetwise, vigilant. I think um, you need to you need to respect what you what you've put your money into and. Listen, if you're walking around with a with a t shirt on and a half a million pound watch with no security or in, in a rough part of town, the chances are you could be robbed. So I just thought think you should ch- just pick your battles a bit. Yeah, pl- pl- plan your trips. Um, the be- hard question that to answer to be honest with you. Yeah, especially selling the stuff. Yeah, it's hard to. Do you know what it is? It's like because it's, it's counterintuitive. Because um, the probably the. There is a kind of a more what people would perceive as the right answer, but yeah. but by saying that right answer, you're actually affecting your business because you need you need to sell watches. But being businessmen then yeah. in the watch industry, what can the government, what can the authorities do more to clamp down on people getting robbed for their I watches? Think, I think the authorities in the government should have a better attitude towards it instead of just saying you shouldn't walk around with such an expensive watch. Why shouldn't you? Why not? Why not? Why not celebrate what you've achieved? Why not feel good about, like we said earlier, it's a medal. Why can't you wear it? It means something to you. You inherit. You maybe you inherited it off your grandfather, father. I don't know. Why? What gives other people the right 
to determine you not wearing something that you like. Oh, you can't have a nice car because people are going to scratch it or you can't. Like, why? Who says Who says you can't? I think if you've worked hard and you want to buy something for yourself, you should be able to wear it anywhere. Like, if you get a nice car, you want to drive, drive it. it. You yeah. want to not show it off, but you feel good when you get in that car. You know that you've worked so hard to achieve that. And I think that's what it is with a watch. You work so hard and then you buy yourself a watch because... It's just like a, it's a massive achievement. Like you said, it's like a medal. You ain't going to walk around with a medal on your chest, but you you could walk around with a watch and every day you look at it and you're proud of yourself of what you've achieved. And I think what they could do is, yeah, it's just clamp down on it a bit. I think it changed their attitude a little bit. Yeah. It's, like you said, there's a lot of wealthy people that come here from all over the world. They've got nice belongings. They've got valuables on them. Why shouldn't they be allowed to walk around with, 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 what, with what they want? Why not? And I think those people that do come here as tourists and they're mainly the ones who have been targeted and robbed because they don't know where they are in, in, in certain parts of this country or this city. So they go down the wrong street or they don't know if someone's uh, looking at their watch or whatever. But I think the authorities and the government should protect those people, the tourists, the people bringing money into this country, the people doing good. Why not? Instead of having the attitude, you shouldn't walk around with Yeah, I don't things. think it's just watches what are the problem. It's every, lux Cars, it's like every luxury asset, I think. If like, it's where watches are so now in the last two years there's so much in the limelight and everyone knows about yeah. watches and what they're worth and they're a great investment and they just keep going up in value I think that's what's brought the stigma to the watch yeah the watches and the thing is if you're in a, a wealthy city London New York Paris anywhere anywhere yeah. you could go into a certain bar club brand Nobu Novakov yeah. Hakkasan and you know there's going to be a massive amount of people in there that are going to have nice watches bags etc so if you had that mindset of a thief you could you could probably stay something it's where you, easy, you, you yeah exactly mm -hmm. and the thing is this will slip off in someone's pocket and then you can run off we were talking earlier about this Richard Hamilton 165 yeah. uh, 65,000 pounds well yeah. I challenge anyone to try and get it from the basement go up the the, the 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 stairs try and get out the door without damaging it mm -hmm. and then try and nick it it's almost yeah. impossible yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 so take a painting off the wall without damaging it and then try and sell it on 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 on, on the secondary market is almost impossible it can happen but rarely does whereas watches or jewelry or diamonds it's very small aren't it's there yeah. it's there it's there to get i personally agree with you guys though i think the authorities should do more and i don't like the attitude of well you should be rubbing it in people's faces or you should be the, yeah. you know no I should be allowed to do what I want and you guys should be tackling the, 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 the problem. They should be saying, keep on wearing your nice stuff, keep inspiring others who are trying to get to that level. Because that's what it is. When I've got something nice, my friends take it as inspiration. I don't want to rub it in people's faces at all because I know what it's like to have nothing and I know what it's like to have something. But I wouldn't rub it in anyone's face. So I think, yeah, like I see you've got a nice watch on first thing I said to you is like wow nice watch like it's inspirational and it makes you smile looking at people do well yeah I, I agree with that um, I've got a little snippet from an article and I'll read it to you yeah being in the world of Kettle Kids is like being in a Guy Ritchie movie <laughs> what does that mean I'm not actually sure who wrote that about us. <laughs> but... Wallpaper. It was only happened a few hours ago. Because oh, wow. I, I kept on refreshing, refreshing, getting, I always do a little bit of homework on my, uh, on, on my guests. And um, it was a, a fresh one earlier today. And I thought, okay, that's, that sounds like a good thing. What do you think that interpretation means, being in a Guy Ritchie movie? I think a bit of hustle and bustle, ups and downs, sort of starting from nothing. And humble beginnings in a way like... Yeah, and where we come from in London. We come from South London and when you're from South London, you kind of have quite a, not a massive vision. You feel like South London's everything and to step out of that and... Bit of a bubble. Yeah, it's a bubble you're in and it's very hard to get out of that bubble. But what you got to do, you have to take a leap and take a risk and that's what we did. And we just... We're, we're, we're literally like hustlers, you know what I mean? We're, we just put we're the just work in. We take risks. Yeah, we take risks. We take risks and it's like in South London... It's so, so close to central London. And for me, it's like you can stand in South London and you can see the money in West End. So it's like, it's in reach. So why not go and get it? Why not try everything you can every day in your power to make something of your life? You've been gifted with being so, so close to real money in Knightsbridge, in Mayfair, where we're, where we're surrounded now. Why not take the chance? 
Why not grab it with both hands? You can see it. So I know from just having a conversation with you guys and watching you from afar on social media that I know your brand is uber important, your staff, the culture, the watches, your product, everything. But let's strip all that back. The number one rule with business, is you've got to turn over a profit because if not, you're not a business and everything falls away. Correct, yeah. How important is money to you guys? It's important, but I wouldn't say it's everything for me. Yeah, I think it's the same with me. I don't think, you know, really rich people who are really unhappy and I know really poor people are really happy. Yeah. And that's the truth. I'd, I want to be that balance. I want to always be happy. And I don't think I ever, ever will think that money rules everything and that money is everything. I think happiness, family, working with friends, meeting new people, traveling the world and making memories is worth a lot more than money. Yeah. Obviously, you need money to be able to do that. That is the hard and you, thing. And, and going back to your question, you need to keep turning over the business, turn over the money, profit, all that sort of stuff, all the numbers. That is so important to keep something growing. Yeah. But I think the main thing is to be honest and true to yourself, like to stick by what you believe in, be passionate about what you're doing. And I think the money comes personally. Like if we rewind, rewinded it to five years ago, we could never have dreamt, to be honest with you, of the money that we've earned. That's the truth. You thought you'd earn a few quid, but you never dreamt that you'd earn that much. Don't get me wrong, it's up and down. Sometimes we take losses. Sometimes we, we, we don't win. But when you do, it's like, let's go back. Let's think about where we started from. We're winning. We're massively winning. Just keep the mindset. Don't let the money take over you. Don't let it change you. I think when it changes you, you're done. Um, there's a lot of cliche sayings on Instagram and social media about money and about success. And some of them are kind of wanky and some of them are quite true. And I remember younger, they used to say money is the root of all evil. Yeah. But then I heard someone who I really respect and reframed it. They said the, the lack of money is a root of all evil. Like and he said, <laughs> think about what I'm saying. If someone is desperate, what do they do? They're going to break the law because they're trying to get money, money yeah. and it's a lack of money. And I thought that is so true. And that's when they do but, something evil. Yeah, but to say that to, to someone, not business people like yourself, but to maybe somebody else, they see it as kind of like arrogant. It's not though. I think I think if you can build a good business, give people jobs, give value to your audience and your collectors or to your customers, earn some money and use that money, obviously for your own personal stuff, but also give back. To communities That's or charity. Like every, everyone who works, sorry to interrupt you. Everyone who works at Kettle Kids is either a family member or a friend from where we grew up. We've got ex-scaffolders who work for us who are now doing multi-million pound deals over, over the course of a year. We've got bus drivers who work. These are all people that we know from the area we grew up in. Also, very humble beginnings, never had much. All go-getters, grafted. We've got market market um, stall dealer. All these people have got the foundations and the mindset to earn money. And the main thing is to go and get it. Go and do whatever they can to earn money within, like you said, within the law. They stick to their jobs. They graft it every day. These people, some of these people have got no education. But like, yeah, just going back to what you said. And this is what I was saying about at the start, about yeah, being, 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 being authentic. Yeah. You know, even that story there is authentic. And you were talking about this earlier. If once an investor will hear this conversation, they'll be, they'll be like, wow, these people are so, the kettle kids are so authentic, even with the staff members they've got. Yeah. It's not all, it's not been staged. They've not gone out there to try and find the perfect person. They've brought in their inner circle mm -hmm. and turned them into, into, into winners like you guys. Mm -hmm. And that makes it kind kind of like an invest investable business. So number one, have you ever thought about getting investors? Number two, people must approach you all the time about new opportunities within your field, outside your field. Answer to these both questions. I mean, to to answer to 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 give me an answer to both. Would you take on an investment, and would you look at other opportunities? I'll answer the investor one. We wouldn't look to take on any investors because. We believe that between us and where we want to go and how we want to keep the business, we're happy to keep doing what we're doing within our means without it going too corporate, without it going too, not true to what we are. We're very like 
Would you agree? We very want to keep the values and we want to keep it how. Yeah, we don't want the Kettle Kids name to change. Change. Like we yeah. want it. To, like we want it to be known as what it is now and to carry on. We don't want it to change on the so, longest way. Sort of. Steve, when he was going back to saying like when we was opening the branch on Maddox Street, and you had the thought of changing it to a different name because it suited everyone else. But hold on a minute. Yeah, that was only mainly because of what everyone else was saying. So, Kettle Kids isn't going to work in Mayfair. But who, but who are they, to, what say, I mean? who are they to say, was, who are they yeah. to say that? It's working. And that's what it done. It put, us, it put something in our head. And me and Harvey just sat there one day and we looked at John and we said, mate, we've we, built this up for so many years. Do you think we're changing the name now from Kettle Kids to something else to make everyone else like happy? We've put the graft in for six years. And now for us, we don't want investors coming along to take the glory or to sway it into what they think is right or to make it something that it's not the for us i think we've got each other and i think that's enough to be honest with you yeah yeah uh, this is good this is a re really yeah. silly comparison but it, it just popped into my head because i'm chatting to him at the moment about doing a podcast dj fat tony then if you know this guy he used to be a fat guy called tony <laughs> and he, he he used to be on drugs and he was a proper addict and you know he was in his own words like catastrophic ball of energy you know everything he was doing it was just mental drugs everything else cleaned himself up got really fit but his name is still dj tony and he played for elton john he played for the beckhams and you would think as an outsider hang on a minute the beckhams are not going to order a guy called dj fat tony who used to be a heroin addict who used to be really fat to their 40th 50th 60th birthday party wherever it may be but in actual fact he's just embraced that kind of who he was yeah. And where he is now and i know it's totally different we're talking about a dj versus yep. you know uh, a brand here but in a way it's a bit of a sort of similar sort of thing sort of, sort he's, of, stuck, sort of. he's stuck true to who he was there then and who he is now and people obviously invest in that and 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 buy into that and agree with what he's what he sticks by yeah i think people respect you more if you stay true to yourself yeah and that's how we've always been from the beginning we've always stayed true to ourselves and we've not changed to make other people happy we yeah like the culture of what we've had from when we first started to now we've stuck with it we're not changing to we've, make we've gained other we've gained happy, yeah. a little bit of a different culture and yeah. a different client base obviously opening mayfair in opposed to what we had before there was a lot of a younger audience now we've got a lot older older audience as well that we're seeing to so like we've got it both we've got it all going on really like you said earlier about kieran's got all of his footballers clients and he was at man U and all the rest of it but for us it's like we want clients across the board. We want the old people, the young people, the rappers, the footballers, the, everyone, the enthusiasts. We're, we're pretty much open doors to everyone. Yeah, we literally sell watches from a guy who works as an electrician to a CEO of a... No. Like in, our, in our store yesterday, you've got a guy, I'm sure he was a... I'm sure he was a roofer or something like that. And then you had like a celebrity turn up with his 10-man entourage, walk through the shop. Like that roofer has never met a celebrity. He's never dreamt of meeting a celebrity. Next thing you know, they're taking a photo together in our store because the doors at Kettle Kids is open to all walks of life. And I think that's so important. We don't turn no one down. We sell items of jewellery and watches from like 500 pounds up to half a million pounds like we were speaking about earlier. Therefore, we cater for everyone. Like we treat everyone with the same respect. We Everyone gets the same like attention. Everyone gets... Same yeah, customer yeah. service, everything. And I think that's what makes us unique to everybody else. There's not another jeweler like that in the UK. And that's what makes us different from the rest of the field. I, I, I was going to ask, it's a little bit of a hard question. I mean, I've asked similar sort of questions to like Tom Hartley in the car world, uh, car world in comparison to like Romans or in comparison to Joe Macari or etc. There's other jewelers out there. Trotters Jewelers, A Jewelers, there's a bunch of others who've got very, very big presences. What is the major difference between the Kettle Kids to some of these other brands I've just mentioned? We work harder than them. Yeah, and we've got, we're a lot younger, so we've got a lot, a lot to give. I disagree with Jacob there because I don't think we're a lot younger. Yeah, well, I think we're a fair bit. Like, they've been in the industry a lot longer than what I we think, have. Yeah, I think, I, I don't think we're younger, but I think we've got less experience. So therefore, where they've been in, in the game longer than us, they've sort of would think, oh no, they're just newbies. They'll be gone in a minute. But before you know it, we was knocking on the doors all over. Has any of, not saying these brands, yeah. but any competitors 
old school people or even the new ones. Has anyone ever tried to put you out of business? They're bad mouthing us all the time. I think anybody who's talking about you, it doesn't matter if it's bad or good. I look at it, it's always good, to be honest with they, you. They, what made me giggle last week, remember this one, yeah. is that we had a customer come in. I'm not going to say any names. And he said, I was speaking to another jewellers and they said not to buy from you guys because you guys have got the store in Maddox Street now, so your overheads are a lot more. You're charging more money for stuff. And it just made me laugh that they used... Everything that we put in to a store and the investment we've made and the overheads that we have got, and they tried to make it play in their favour when it wasn't the case at all. And if it was the case, why would the customer be in our store telling us the story if they thought they was being overcharged? So basically, they just made something out of nothing. It didn't work. It backfired. The customer bought his watch from us, said that we've got a customer for life. So it, it, it just makes you laugh, to be honest with you. The naysayers. Do they ever absolutely make up stuff as well? Like, I don't know. Well, that's them, what them, them, them guys are selling a fake watch, for example. Does that ever come out? We've had, they say that uh, it's the quality that we're selling isn't right. Yeah, it? you know, like in diamond stuff, for example. So like diamond crusted jewellery and watches. They say our oh, quality is different. Or they'll say theirs, this, their, their quality is the same, yeah. but a lot less price. They, it's just it's lots of rooms and, and, and things that. like I can imagine like um, ours is factory set theirs is the after after set and where where that could be a complete lie as well yeah or um, you know that watch yeah it's protect parts but it shouldn't be with that yeah, watch and, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah yeah, yeah did, but that drives us to be honest with you Fuel yeah. us. like keep saying it keep saying it it's happy days I want to do like a Almost like a bit of a quick fire thing, um, because I want to just get your take on 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 the on these brands. So what I was going to do is just ask the same question to both of you, and the first description, one word answer, what comes to your mind, just say it. Right, cool. <laughs> so Jacob, Rolex. First word to describe Rolex is, I'd say solid. Harvey, Rolex. The best. Cartier to you. Stylish. Cartier to you. I'd probably say trendy. Richard Mill. Unique. Richard Mill. Crazy. One of Mars PK. Smart. I'd like to say slick. Patek Philippe. Different class. Patek Philippe. Yeah, the Holy Grail. Yeah. So out of all those watches, them brands, which one would you say is the best? Rolex. Why? I think Rolex because out of all those brands, Rolex is the only brand that doesn't need to advertise. Doesn't need to do any marketing if it doesn't want to. You go anywhere in the world with a Rolex and people would recognise it. And it's got... You would to some jewellers with a Patek Philippe or a Richard Mill, the jewellers might be a bit weary of it. Don't want to buy it. Price might go down. The price might. It's not really for me. Very expensive watch. Rolex is just like bang in the middle. Like I said, so iconic. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I called it solid because it's just solid. I think Rolex is the one brand out of Patek Philippe, Richard Mille, and Audemars PK, which is solid. Like the prices, um, and like Harvey said, you can go anywhere in the world with a Rolex, and no jeweler would think twice about buying it off you. Mm. Where with the other brands, they're a bit skeptical. Yeah. I've left the uh, brand off of here because um, uh, there was once upon a time when I was younger, there, it seemed to be like the go-to watch. And I still feel like, it, but not behind the scenes, but in sport, they're really trying to give it a good go. And I reckon if, if I lived in another country, I think I would see them a lot more. But there are certain watch dealers that completely slag them off online. Yeah. Hublot. Yeah, Hublot. Yeah. Yeah. What's, your, what's your take on Hublot? I think Hublot is... Not the best made watch in comparison to the other brands we just spoke about. But I think the main thing what Hublot do wrong, it's still a luxury brand. It's still a great watch in my eyes. But what they do wrong is they offer too much discount on their watches in opposed to the other brands which offer none. And so they're they, too accessible. Yeah, that's it. You can go into any store watch in Switzerland, Maplin and Webb and you'll pick up a Hublot, for example. All and the models are available. All the models are there. They're in the counters. They've got the prices. They're available. There's no waiting list. It's different to Rolex, Patek Philippe, and all the Mars PK. You're on a waiting list. Um, 
we can sell you both for under retail. And that kind of shows that they haven't, I don't know if we could say marketed themselves properly or they're just making it, yeah, like I said, too accessible. You can go anywhere in the world, any shop that sells watches and you'll be able to pick up a Hublot. And it's such a shame because they yeah. actually look kind of, kind of good. I have actually got one and I never wear it. It's been in the safe for, for many, many years. It's a big bang skeleton face. And when I, when I first got it, I picked it up from a jeweler, uh, sorry, a brand around the corner called Marcus, who, which is no longer here now. He used to be right next to Cartier. It, it shut down a few years ago. And what you just said there, I went into shop. I think it was £19,100. It was. What discount did you get? The thing is, I didn't even ask for one. Yeah. And they, and they said, come here like that. And anyway, I went, went, I, so a, um, a guy called Chris, what was his name? Anderson, Anders. He used to be a jeweler in uh, Hatton Gardens and he okay. took me there because I said I was after Hublot. I'd sort of bought into the whole hype of it all yeah. at the time. They look cool. It's, it's got rose gold. I think it looks re really nice. Uh, but like I say, I never really wear it. It's too bulky. And went in there, expected to pay full retail price. And the guy went, oh, come here. And he took me around the corner and I ended up paying like, I think I paid close to 14 grand for it. Yeah. And there was all, it was great at the time because I was like, oh, this is great. But now looking back, it's like you yeah. gave me a discount for something I didn't even need to give a discount so if, to. If someone's gave you a discount on something, then that's brand new. Then when you come to sell it secondhand, where, where, where'd you sit? Because the guy who wants to buy a secondhand one could go in there and get himself for the same sort of price what you're trying to ask. So, Do you sell a lot of hublots? No, we Hardly. probably have one in stock or two in stock at the moment. Okay. Where um, we probably have 150, 200 Rolexes, 50 to 60 Audemars PKs, and probably like eight to nine Richard Mills. So, yeah. What do you sell the most of? Rolex. Rolex. And when you say you've got the stock, is that what you own or is it clients that have given it to you on consignment for you to we sell? We have a little bit of consignment from clients and customers, but yeah, most of it's like what we own, yeah. Okay, if I walked in and said, right, yeah, I'm going to buy something I like, yeah, and all that, all that, you know, the stuff that you should say, but yeah. come on, guys, give me some advice here. I've got a million pound, what should I buy? I want it to be a good investment. What what should I be, what should I buy? I think stainless steel Rolexes. Yeah, me personally, I wouldn't buy one watch. I'd probably buy with a million pounds. You can buy yourself, you could probably buy yourself 30 or 40 very special pieces of a million pounds, I would say. I'd go for Rolexes. I'd maybe get one Patek Philippe, one Audemars. Could even settle with one Richard Mille, but I'd mainly invest in Rolex. I think there's an analogy which I always say to people, which is if you used to go fishing for the weekend, you've got more chance catching a fish with 10 or 20 fishing rods in the lake than you've got trying to catch one big fish with one fishing rod. So like Jacob said, million pounds, spread your bets go and buy all, all different types of rolex or other brands as well but you're better off doing that than buying one richard mill for a million pounds for instance and hoping it will go up um what i ask you very similar question to what i just did with the you know the the first word that comes to your mind about a brand if money was no object and you could both answer this together money was no object what rolex would you buy now i don't want to hear Oh, I've customised what, you know, I'm just talking about a straight model. Yeah. yeah. What would you buy? Money's no object, Rolex. I'd buy a Rolex presidential day date in yellow gold. Yeah, me personally, it'd be the Rolex Daytona Platinum. Audemars PK, the same question. Money's no object. Probably buy an uh, Audemars PK offshore on a rubber strap. Make it a bit sporty. Yeah, Audemars. me personally, what I'd buy, no money, no object. I'd go for Audemars PK, Roy Woke, and it'd probably be an open work, so the skeleton in stainless steel. I prefer stainless steel than rose gold. I prefer stainless steel, yeah. and I think the one that you bought over the other week, but that was in rose gold, yeah. was the, I'm trying to remember now. I did tell you this, didn't I? 40 millimetre. 37. 37. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I went up. Yeah, I know, yeah. That's really nice, that watch. Okay, Richard Mill. Um, I'd go for the RM30 Titanium. I'd go for the Pharrell Williams with a spaceman on it. Yeah. How much is that watch? I think it's about three million. Patek Philippe, what one would you go for if money was no object? I'd go for the 5990 rose gold with the blue dial. Yeah, me personally, I like the 5980R. So it's the older model of the 5990 rose gold with the black dial. You know what I would go for? I would go for the Tiffany dial. Oh, wow. Yeah. How much is that watch? 
Three, four million? I yeah, think. it varies from three million up to 10 million. It just all depends who's got one and who's got one for sale at the time. Yeah, because I'm a bit skeptical with it because I like it a lot. I think it's really, really cool. Watch, I think it's clean looking. And I like the fact that it is stainless steel. Yeah. And because of that face change, it makes it you a whole different. Like my, my choice is a bit average now. <laughs> <laughs> but so, it, 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 you know, like it's, it's stainless steel. And it shouldn't cost that much money, yeah. but because because it is so much money, yeah. I just you just I don't know this this the psychology of it. I just really like, even though I love the rose gold watch. Um, is it because the likes of LeBron James, and is it because of the likes of the high flying celebrities like Jay Z, because they are wearing it? it makes it so expensive or is it g genuinely worth that that amount of money no because it literally is a stainless steel patek philippe with a tiffany stamp dial in blue do you know what i mean so when you look at it like that it is celebrities who are wearing these watches which are increasing the yeah, price they and that's very yeah. unique yeah. and there's only a certain amount a probably amount of them made but people like jay-z lebron james they're massive influence on the world and on anything they wear it just goes up. If Jay Z put on a Hublot tomorrow and wore the Hublot, I guarantee you Hublot sales tomorrow will be through the roof. Guaranteed. He was he was one of the first people to be rapping about Hublot, Hublot and stuff. And, and they you could say it. They were hot. Look mm. at Jacob and Co. Now everybody's wearing Jacob and Co's. Jacob and Co. fell out of the game. They was nobody. Nobody wanted them. Nobody rated them. Now Jacob and Co.'s come back with a massive, massive comeback. Massive. Yeah. They got Conor McGregor wearing them. They got Cristiano Ronaldo. They've got everybody wearing Jacob and Co.'s, and now they're the new. Not the new thing, but it's what everybody's back. talking about. It's yeah. back, like and they're back with a bang, and that's because of the people who are wearing them. Some, some of the, some of the, I mean, like the one he was wearing, which has got like a um, roulette table. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I get, I, look, hats off to them. I mean, it must be so difficult to make make a watch like yeah. that. And the craftsmanship is ten out of ten, but. It's sort of really, it's sort yeah. of so ridiculous. Yeah, that that's why people want them. Yeah, and do you know, like sometimes when like the 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 it strikes another hour and then it's like a man banging a woman yeah. and stuff like that. It's like, yeah. all right. Like yeah. if I was a, a pimp, what if I was a pimp, then maybe, but come on, is someone really going to pay mm. 500 grand for... I think it's with people with money to burn, isn't it? Really? It's, it's almost yeah. like, this is so stupid, but because I've got so much money, I can do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I did say to you before we started, I would like to do a part two where I come over to Maddox street and actually do a walk around and maybe do not necessarily a sit down podcast like this but basically walk with the lapel mics and and, and walk around before we do that the last segment of this podcast if i was a client coming to the kettle kids for the first time in maddox street walk me through from the moment i open that door to the moment i sit down by a particularly richard mill and walk out that door what is the customer experience like so as you walk in obviously you get greeted by our security doorman and then you be let through the doors all secure you feel like you're in a nice positive place after going through that and then a member of the team will just yeah greet you ask how they can help today was you just browsing did you want to see anything in particular and then yeah we just you just get a personal treat treatment really like one one. if you want a glass of champagne orange juice yeah. coffee water and you literally get to do you know what it is with us and Mad our Maddox Street store we've literally got pretty much every most the majority of models are watches and that's what's quite unique to every other store you can go and watches in switzerland you're not going to find or you have to wait or you have to wait for example you're not going to find the rolex gmt batman you're not going to have to try it on you're not going to have to try it open works ap on or a platinum daytona we've actually got them in physical stock so you come in like harvey said you go through you feel safe you're in a secure premises in a nice area a nice street in London and we, we give a great experience. We've got a team of people, like you said, who are, they've learned how, and they've learned a lot, sorry, about watches over the years, but they're not, they haven't been born into watches or they've started doing watches since they were They 15. found their love for watches. They found their love for watches. They've learned over the years about watches. And I think that's what makes us unique to everyone else. Really you go and watch the Switzerland, you're, you're dealing with a salesman where in Kettle Kids, you're dealing with somebody who actually has a passion for watches. And they didn't have it at first, but they found that passion and they love them. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Because not everyone's born with the born with passion or born with the fire in their stomach to sit out and I'm going to do this in life. Like you go to watches of Switzerland, you go to these other places, and I know really wealthy people, and they're like, I don't like going in there. I don't like the way they treat me. And they feel uncomfortable. Feel uncomfortable. Yeah. The main thing is, as soon as people come in, they feel comfortable. 
going back to like our celebrity clients and other clients that we've got, they've actually become friends of ours because they feel comfortable with us. They invite us to places all over the world. They, we, we, we hang out together. We have a beer together. We're so like, we just keep it real to be honest with you. I nearly forgot to ask this question and I think it's quite an important one. Chrono 24. Mm. Good thing, bad thing for the watch industry? Mm. I think it's a bit, bit 50-50, Chrono. The, the prices are very inflated so it doesn't really give people a clear indication of what their watch is worth in opposed to actually coming into the store, having a chat. How's, my, how's this model getting on? Or how's that one getting on? Or getting on the phone? That is all authentic. Chrono 24 inflated they take a massive percentage of the price of the watch so the jeweler actually seems to earn less or the watch dealer earns less than chrono are taking most of the time so it's a business and i get it and it's a great platform and it's got loads on it but is it true to value? Yeah, to be seen worldwide I, I guess it's it's a good it's a good platform to be on but you ain't getting that experience of talking to somebody on the phone or messaging somebody and being authentic. There's no culture there. There's no culture, yeah. You can't buy that. And you don't know who is behind, behind like, who are you buying this off? Mm. How, like, what are they? How long have they been around for? I get, it, listen, we use it, but it isn't. It's not our main tool. It's not our main tool, yeah. No. And I know, because I know a lot of people in the watch industry, yeah. uh, Charlie Groom, for example, good friend of mine, and he's yeah. part of the reason why I got to know you guys. Yeah. So, so thanks to him. Um, client versus, you know, a brand like yours is, oh yeah, well, I seen it on Chrono Twenty Four for X, and I don't think it's fair that you're offering me this, mm. and they've got a misconception about yeah, the the, 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 the yeah. values because I could list a piece of art for two million quid somewhere. Knowing it's not worth that, mm. but I can play it off that. Oh, look, it's not there for that. Yeah, one point nine. Yeah, do you, do, 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 uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Are them watches physical? Are they available now? We don't know. Anybody can list on Chrono. I could go and list this watch today on Chrono and say put it up for one hundred and fifty thousand, and then I have somebody call me and they're like, "It's on there for one hundred and fifty thousand." And I say, "But if you look at the other watches, they're priced at two hundred thousand. So is this one still available?" If if if. I feel like if people really did believe in Chrono, then they wouldn't be at the stage of having a conversation with us about Chrono. They would have already purchased it. Yeah. Yeah. Outside of <laughs> uh, business, you both become uh, fathers recently. You're about to get married. Can, uh, can I say that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> congratulations, first Thank and you. foremost. We were obviously having a bit of a deep conversation upstairs about the uh, blessing and also the... Nappy changing. <laughs> yeah, the, the sleepless nights, etc. What comes first now? Family or business? <coughs> Do you know what? For me, I think family, but I do also believe it's pretty much 50-50 because without the business and without the passion for business, the rest of it can't run or not as what we know it. I was going to actually, I was going to answer the question before you could Go just on. to take the soft and the blow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know that's a, quite a hard <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say for me, business, by putting business first, it puts my family first. Because if I don't do the business, my family suffer. Yeah, yeah, that's puts, how, that's yeah it puts say. our family yeah. in a better position, our business and how hard we work. They understand that we have to put business first to be able to put our whole family in a better position. I think it's more mindset as yeah. well. Like if you don't do what you enjoy or what you're passionate about, then your family can't get the real you, the, the true who you are. Like I was saying earlier, like one of my clients has got, <coughs> one of our clients has got a show tonight and off the cuff, he was like, can you bring my jewelry? Like, I want you to put it on me on stage. I want to do a video. Like it's my first show of the UK. And then I'm straight on the phone to my missus. Like, don't worry about my dinner. Like I've got to do this because that is what gives us all the life and the purpose of what we do every day. And, 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 and I think like sort of builds our personalities as well. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I, I know, again, social media is a, is a way of giving you false impressions about how life should be or could be. Work-life balance, I mean, from all the hustlers, entrepreneurs, millionaires, billionaires that I know of, directly or indirectly, I don't really see there is a balance. I think that most people who are, who've got a mission are obsessed. Yeah, they have moments where they go away. Yes, they have moments with their family. And they love it dearly, 
but in the back of their mind, and I'm like this, I'm, I'm thinking about thinking about business. And Eddie Hurden said it the best. He knows he's not been 100% the best father. He knows that, he admits that, but he can't be the best father and the best business person yeah. because that's not the reality of life. One of them has got to give. And the only way he can give everything to his family is by giving everything to the business. Say, yeah. And this is, and it comes back round. Yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to see the I psychology. I was to say that as well. I psychology. To myself and yeah. it was the same. It is actually an addiction. And what we are, we're addicted to working hard. And like you said, it, it works in a big circle. I also believe if your partner, for instance, doesn't support your goals, your mission, your passion, then I don't think she's the partner or he's the partner for you, to be honest with you. Sack them off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Last question. So you probably heard my podcast. I come up with my mantra. Uh, when I done my story this morning in my gym and I was watching one of your videos, at the last of my story, I've got it above my gym and it says, be happy, never content. I've got my own reason what that means. But if I were to ask you guys, the Kettle Kids, what does be happy, never content mean to both of you? Mm. I think be happy in what you're doing day to day. But if you, the moment you sit still and are content with that, everything you've set out to achieve will slip away. Yeah. I think he nailed it on the head there. Yeah. <laughs> I think you've just got to, be, I think you got to be happy. Of course, that's the main thing. I think happiness is everything, really. If you're not oh, happy, happiness is the key to success. Yeah, if you're not, yeah, happiness is the key to success. That is it. And if you're not happy, why? We're, we're not here forever. Do you know what I mean? So you've got to be happy in what you do. If you ain't happy in what you do, maybe do something different until you find something what you're actually going to be 100% happy in. And that's what it is. Happy, like you said, be happy, not content. You've got to be so happy and just never fall behind, just stay on top of what you've got to do. I know it's cliche and everyone sort of says it, but it's like, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day yeah. in your life. And every day, like, as soon as the sun's up, we're raring to go. Like, it's like we just started selling watches, like, this week. It's like, every day is new, every day is a, a new chance to, a new beginning and a new I don't chance. think you can ever yeah. take your foot off the gas in, if you love something, what you do. Like, like he said, it doesn't feel like, each day we wake up, it doesn't feel like, Work. Work. It, we're so happy in what we're doing. We love watches. We love jewellery. We love, love meeting people. We love well. meeting love people. We love dealing with people yeah. every day. And you just can't take your foot off the gas. You just got to keep going. But I think you, like yourself, you own your own business. You know what it's like. You you love what you do. You're passionate for what you do. And I think if you love something and you're passionate about it, you're never going to fall back. Fall back. Yeah. I think, I don't know. I think this is true what I'm about to say. Is it, is it a bit like a shark that the reason why, I mean, they don't sleep, I don't think, is they, they, Keep on moving forward because the moment they stop moving forward, they literally suffocate. They yeah. have to keep on they swimming. Stop, yeah. And and it's the same kind of thing. You know, they're not they're not angry, they're not this or that. They're they're happy in their own thing and they're moving forward all the time and they're seek, seeking the next challenge and the next next bit of prey or whatever else. And it's kind of a little bit like business and a little, yeah. little bit like life. You've got to just keep on swimming forward and find the a opportunities. Friend, a friend of my, a friend of ours, dad very very successful business friend like very successful and he told us something years ago and it's sort of always stuck in the back of our mind and he said half i said yeah he said thing is you don't want to be hungry they do he said no you don't want to be hungry you want to be starving and for me it just and we always say it all the time not hungry starving and what that to us means is if you're hungry you can sort of like you can be distracted a little bit because you're, you're only hungry there's a lot of other things going on you're hungry but there's a few things going on you sort of looking at it but if you're starving the only thing you're focused on is the starvation just keep going you're starving you're starving and also that could mean every day start as if you've got nothing again reset go out and get everything don't then celebrate the next day and think oh no but i done well yesterday no start again mm. reset button so when we take losses starving. we don't dwell on it we know in business you're going to have highs and you're going to have lows and it messes it doesn't mess with you mentally but it's, it does mess with you mentally in a way because one minute you're up here watches are flying then you've got 200 watches in stock and the markets took a dip you know in your head that you've lost money when you wake up the next morning but if you dwell on that and you you make that ruin your day it's going to ruin that day it's going to ruin the next day and the day after you got to get in that like shop. Like a dominoes effect. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like a dominoes yeah, effect. Sure. You've got to get in that shop with a different mindset. And each day you've got that mindset that 
like he said, I'm starving. I'm not hungry. Do you know what I mean? So that day I come in and I've got to tackle that day and I've got to beat that day. And as soon as I beat that day and I'm at home and I'm chilled. Now it's different as a father, I go home. And like I said to you upstairs earlier when we was having a chat, before I go home and I have all the stress on my head and I'll take in it, like mentally it gets you down, doesn't it? Because you, you've got the work stress, you've got the worries. But then you go home and you're like, work, it, it is essential what you need to do. You work hard because you're, you're an owner of a business. You want to be successful. You want people to remember your name. You want to be a massive brand. You want to be worldwide. But then when you go into your family, it's just like, now I've got a daughter. You're like, oh, wow. It, not every, work isn't everything. Happiness is the main thing. It's the key to success. Definitely, mate. Yeah. Nice one. Nice one. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Um, Honoured to have you on the podcast, guys. Thank you for and I'm um, looking forward to coming over to your place and doing yeah, some content over there. And um, if everyone's enjoyed this, please follow the guys. Subscribe, be happy, never content. And once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Oh, nice one. <laughs>